filled with the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Our own Army Air Force. The best planes ever built, 65,000 planes this year. By the time you finish your training, America will have overwhelming superiority in the air. Well, good morning. Um, I, yeah, he's, Bill said I'm in a lecture. Hopefully it's not a lecture. I'm trying to turn it into a presentation that, uh, you know, is a little bit enjoyable for everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about the battle for Alaska. Uh, how many of you have been to Alaska? Oh, great. How many of you have been out to the Aleutians? Yeah, a few less. Okay. You guys can probably correct me on some things. But um, we're going to go through uh, an interesting phase of World War II. Eighty-one years ago this week, the Japanese occupation of Alaska's Aleutian Islands began. The occupation had lasted for a year, and this is the story. We're going to talk a little bit about Alaska and geography and weather and things like that, just so you can understand the environment that was there. But back in 1935, General Billy Mitchell predicted the invasion of the United States by Japan would come through the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutian chain runs from the Alaskan Peninsula here all the way out to Attu, Japan down here. Uh, in 1942, his prediction nearly came true. So to appreciate the challenges the military faced in Alaska, we need to understand the geography first. So the chain runs 1,000 miles from Cold Bay on the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula out to Attu. The Aleutian Islands are closer to Tokyo than they are to Seattle. Attu is closer to the Kuril Islands of Japan than it is to Anchorage. And headquarters and uh, the, the Pacific Command and Pearl Harbor, 2,600 miles away. So quite isolated um, in the world. To also appreciate the challenges of, the military, of military operations in the Aleutians, let's look at the climate. The Aleutian Islands are bordered by the Bering Sea on the north and the Pacific Island to the south. The area is the birthplace of much of the weather that we get here in North America and is home to what they call the Aleutian Low. The Aleutian Low is a phenomenon caused by the warm Pacific current coming up the east coast of Asia, meeting the frigid waters in the Bering Sea. This picture is a rare day in the Aleutians, but you can see the barren landscape, the steep hills along the shore. Uh, many of these islands are still active volcanoes. The Aleutian summers are short, cool, and windy. The winters are long, cold, and extremely windy and it's overcast most of the time. This is an example of a good day in the Aleutians. You can't tell in the photo, but it's always windy with an average wind speed of 15 miles an hour, the highest of any area in the U.S. The island, islands have three days a month where wind gusts to over 50 miles an hour. This is a typical day in the Aleutians with the high surf, strong winds, and the Aleutians are unique. Even with the cold weather, you can have high winds and fog simultaneously. Certainly not great flying weather. Here's a PBY riding out the horizontal snow and the winds in the winter during World War II. These PBYs didn't quite survive that harsh winter weather. And the Willowas, or, or sudden violent winds that would come down from the mountains, uh, which are common in winter, managed to flip these aircraft. And since we'll be flying the PBY later this morning, I'm going to be highlighting the role of this versatile aircraft in the presentation. Early in the war, the PBYs were used to scout planes and to do milk runs in Alaska. That is, to deliver mail and supplies throughout the Aleutians and to other islands in south-central Alaska. That mission would soon change. 
PBYs were routinely deployed throughout the Aleutians and serviced by seaplane tenders. You can just see a PBY at the aft end up here of the Gillis. Uh, the Gillis and other tenders, the Gillis is a converted World War I destroyer, and other tenders uh, like it uh, provided fuel and munitions to the PBYs while they were deployed. The PT boats you see here uh, really didn't work out very well in Alaska. They were brought to Alaska in hopes that they'd work out, but, but they, uh, they kind of failed miserably with the climate. But this was the best picture I could find of the uh, Gillis with a, with a seaplane. Now, Alaska has strategic uh, significance, and it's by virtue of its geography, it's the strategic crossroads of the world. This actually dates back to prehistoric times. It's believed that between 15 and 30,000 years ago, humans crossed from Asia into Alaska on a land bridge. But in World War II, Alaska became critical to the delivery of lend-lease aircraft to the Soviet Union following this same route across Alaska and into Siberia. Alaska also has several deep water ports, abundant national resources, many of which the Japanese probably could have used. The Aleutian Islands are on the Great Circle Route between the west coast of the U.S. and Japan. Great Circle Routes are the shortest way between two points on a globe. The red line on the map shows the Great Circle Route between Japan and the west coast of the U.S., and it passes through the Aleutian Islands up here. The uh, inset shows a photo of a flight plan from L.A. to Tokyo, and you see Dutch Harbor's right down here. The aircraft is north of the Aleutian Islands. So these routes, while aircraft today use them, were, have been used for years for sea routes. Boats would take the Great Circle routes to make the shortest route between two points. Alaska was critical to the Lend-Lease Program. Lend-Lease Program began in 1941 and was the initial way for the U.S. to become involved in the war without making that all-out declaration of war or employing troops. A unique 6,000-mile air bridge from the lower 48 in the U.S. You know, through Alaska into the Soviet Union was in operation from 1942 to 1945 was known as the Alaska-Siberia Lend-Lease Airway. Aircraft were handed over to the Soviets at Fairbanks in the, in the heartland of Alaska, and from there they uh, changed over. Russian pilots then flew the aircraft to Nome and then on into the Soviet Union. Many of these pilots weren't real familiar with the aircraft, but nonetheless they flew those aircraft into Mother Russia. This photo shows uh, some of the Lend-Lease B-25s, A-20s, and P-39s on the runway at Ladd Field uh, near uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, and it's prior to handing them over to the, uh, the Soviets in September of 1942. More than 30,000 aircraft were sent to the Allies under this Lend-Lease program. 8,000 of those aircraft were delivered by this route through Alaska including nearly 5,000 P-39s that went just to Russia. So, like General Billy Mitchell first saw in 1935, the Japanese also saw the strategic importance of the island chain in the North Pacific. The red line around here pretty much outlines the Japanese ambitions for their empire. They had hoped they could gather this empire together and sue for peace and have a huge Japanese empire by the end of the war, since the rest of the world was distracted in Europe. But to secure this empire, the Japanese needed toeholds throughout the area. And so you had the Fiji Islands down here, you had Midway in the mid middle part, and the Aleutians up at the tip. These anchor locations were key uh, places that they needed to secure. And shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese began developing plans to secure the central and northern Pacific. And just like in, the, uh, in Pearl Harbor, uh, 
Admiral Yamamoto was the architect of what would become the attack on Alaska. In the summer of 1942, the Japanese launched a two-pronged attack on the U.S., first on Midway Island and then the Aleutians. Yamamoto sent four of his main carriers with nearly 250 aircraft and 78 combat ships to Midway in hopes of taking the island and then meeting with the American carrier fleet and defeating them. Battle of Midway stands as one of the great American victories during World War II. Yamamoto also sent a fleet with two aircraft carriers and 2,500 troops to the Aleutians. This was also a twofold mission. First, it was to be a distraction for the Battle of Midway and hopefully draw away U.S. troops and, uh, and part of the fleet. But the second was to, to secure that stronghold in the Aleutians to provide that anchor point for their expansionism. Although, you, although the U.S. sent some cruisers and destroyers up to Alaska, uh, they were no match for the Japanese fleet. So the Japanese plan was to take first Attu, Kiska, and Adak Islands. And they figured that would be enough to provide their anchor position. But first, they wanted to attack Dutch Harbor. That's where the U.S. military had a concentration of military forces for the Aleutian Islands at the, at the tip of the Alaska Peninsula. But thanks to the code breakers who knew that the attack was coming on Midway, the U.S. knew an attack would also come on the Aleutian Islands. So let's set the stage for the battle there. You know, first, talk about the leadership here. The leadership included uh, General Simon Buckner, he was the Alaska Defense Command, Admiral Fuzzy Theobald, who was the uh, Northern Pacific Task Force 8 commander. Operational commanders were uh, Colonel Eric Erickson and the, of the 11th Bomber Command and Captain Leslie Garys for Fleet Air Wing 4. Buckner and Theobald were often at odds with each other. Buckner was more aggressive and wanted to confront the Japanese before they attacked. Theobald was more conservative and wanted to let the Japanese make the first move. This disagreement on strategy wasn't insignificant and got the attention of senior U.S. leaders. Admiral Nimitz placed Admiral Theobald in charge of the Aleutian Islands and Buckner was in charge of the mainland Alaska. And Buckner had been a great proponent for the buildup of the military presence in Alaska. He got a huge boost once it was known the Japanese were going to attack the Aleutians. So in June 1942, U.S. forces in Alaska consisted of 169 aircraft, 54 Navy ships, no aircraft carriers, and 33,000 troops. This was really a smaller force than Yamamoto had sent to invade Midway. But of those 169 aircraft in Alaska, 95 were fighter aircraft. Majority of those were the P-40. P-40 was a rugged aircraft, but was outclassed by many other U.S. fighters. The P-39 was not good in air-to-air -air combat, but was real good at close air support, but neither aircraft was really suited for the Alaskan environment. There were 10 heavy bombers in Alaska, B-17s, B-24s, and LB-30s. The LB-30 was a Lend-Lease variant of the B-24. The B-24 became the bomber of preference in the Alaskan theater because it withstood the harsh climate better than the B-17 and exceeded the uh, flying fortress in nearly every category, range, cruising speed, and bomb load. There were also 34 medium bombers in Alaska, the B-25, B-26, and B-18 Bolos. Uh, the B-25 became the medium bomber of preference because of its increased range and better handling characteristics. And there were 23 PBYs in Alaska. Even with attrition, these numbers of aircraft in Alaska stayed the same pretty much throughout the war because of rotations 
of aircraft and replacement aircraft. The U.S. presence in the Aleutians was limited to uh, two locations, Cold Bay here and at a secret base on Umnak Island. Uh, this base had been constructed. Very few people knew about it, but it was a forward operating base to try to get aircraft closer to Dutch Harbor. Cold Bay was a little further away than UMNAC. Now, the, uh, since the U.S. knew the Japanese fleet was coming, they had discussed the tactics of what they would use. And Admiral Theobald decided, no, he would not confront this Japanese attack force because he didn't have a carrier. And he didn't think the land-based aircraft could support his ships confronting a Japanese armada coming in. So Admiral Theobald decided to put his ships in picket lines out here. Well, the picket lines were about 100 miles apart, so uh, it, would, it would have been fairly easy to slip through, and it was. And on June 1st, the Japanese strike group was sighted about 400 miles from Dutch Harbor, Dutch Harbor here, and the, and the strike group down there on the arrow. And most of the available aircraft that the, uh, that the U.S. had, that had, they'd been holding in Alaska, moved down to Cold Bay and to Umnak, the fields there, so they would be able to intercept any Japanese attack. The Japanese attack group had two carriers, the Junyo and the Ryujo. The, uh, the carriers, while the, the Ryujo, by, because of its displacement, was considered a heavy carrier just because of its displacement, because of its configuration, no island on it, because of it and that configuration, it could only carry the same number of aircraft that an escort carrier like the Junyo could carry. So essentially, what the Japanese had sent were two escort carriers to Alaska with about 50 aircraft, or about 100 aircraft. Uh, the rest of the uh, strike group, they had heavy cruisers, they had a couple, uh, a, a handful of destroyers to, uh, to support the carrier. And on June 3, 1942, the Japanese strike group broke out of the heavy fog they were fighting coming up to Alaska, there's heavy fog in here, which had actually helped them a lot. It had concealed their approach. The PBYs were only getting spotty reports of where the Japanese forces were because of the weather. The strike group was about 180 miles south of Dutch Harbor when the carriers launched their attack on both Dutch Harbor and uh, nearby Fort Mears. Both carriers launched fighters and bombers, but due to weather, most of Junio's aircraft aborted the mission and returned to the carrier. But two of their Zeros, of the, of the uh, Junio Zeros, along with nine Zeros and 13 Kates from the Ryujo, pressed on with the attack. The U.S. had little notice of this early morning attack. U.S. fighter aircraft from the, sec uh, the secret base on Umnak Island didn't get the word, there were some communication failures, that Dutch Harbor was under attack, and the fighters at Cold Bay turned out they were too far away to intercept the attacking Japanese. The first wave consisted of Zeros who strafed the facilities and a PBY, they also strafed a PBY that was trying to take off. The Zeros were followed by four waves of the Cates carrying uh, bomb loads. The first attack resulted in minor damage, but did kill 35 of the 6,282 soldiers at Dutch Harbor. Most of those 35 were new arrivals on the base and were unfamiliar with the shelter locations. Second attack that day and more on the next day hit the petroleum storage and killed eight more soldiers, but marked the end of the attacks on Dutch Harbor. Ultimately, 43 Americans were killed and another 50 were wounded in the attacks. The Japanese may have continued the attack, but the carriers were recalled because of the stunning defeat at Midway. Ground forces and ships, U.S. ground forces and ships in Dutch Harbor put up a heavy barrage of flak, but few of the Japanese aircraft were shot down. The Japanese did lose five dive bombers 
uh, two fighters. One Zero took hits from both ground fire and possibly from an airborne PBY that was uh, trying to get out of the Dutch Harbor area and flying into a cloud. This fighter would later crash on Akatan Island. And possibly one of the biggest wins for the U.S. out of this whole attack was the recovery of a nearly intact Zero that would, had been shot at during their attack on, on Dutch Harbor. The Japanese had designated Akatan Island as a place for aircraft to ditch if they had to. The idea was that they would land and then walk to the shore where a Japanese submarine would pick them up. There's only one problem with this idea. The Japanese hadn't surveyed the island, and, what, and it was covered with tundra. So what looked like a nice grassy landing strip to the pilot turned out to be tundra, which is really a peat bog. So he lowered his gear, touched down, tried to land, immediately flipped over into the soft tundra. But this kept the aircraft relatively intact. In fact, his, uh, his uh, wingman who saw him go down had initial thoughts that he'd survived the landing and would get out and, go and, uh, and be recovered. So they didn't bother to strafe and destroy his aircraft. A week later, a PBY spotted the wreckage. U.S. recovered the Zero, shipped it to San Diego where it was repaired. It was flying within three months and provided new information to the U.S. pilots. They found out the Zero could, didn't perform well at high speeds. It rolled left much easier than it would roll right, and its engine would cut out because of a carburetor in a steep dive. The U.S. flew the Akatan Zero against several U.S. fighters. The results were mixed. But the Corsair and the Lightning performed the best against the Zero. The U.S. developed new tactics for other aircraft to successfully engage the Zero, but still warned pilots to never attempt to dogfight the Zero below 300 miles an hour. So throughout the rest of the war, the Akatan Zero was used to familiarize pilots headed for the Pacific. In February 1945, the Zero was chewed up by a taxiing hell diver, hiding in the room behind me here. Not this one, but one like it. Two days after the attack on uh, Dutch Harbor, the Japanese landed 1,700 troops on Kiska and Attu Island. The original plan had been also to land on Adak Island, but the Japanese troop commander discarded that idea since he didn't have enough, feel he had enough forces to occupy and hold three islands. The 550-man strong Japanese invasion of Kiska found a 12-man Navy weather detachment and a dog that offered no resistance. So the, uh, and the Japanese occupation force there on Kiska eventually grew to 7,800 military and civilian personnel. On Attu, the Japanese invasion force of 1,150 troops also met no resistance. They liberated 43 native Alaskans and captured a missionary couple. Japanese occupation force there eventually grew to over 3,000 on Attu. American response to the Japanese invasion was immediate. On June 11th, a combined force of U.S. and Army aircraft unleashed a near-continuous three-day bombing campaign. It was known as the Kiska Blitz, in which they dropped 65,000 tons of bombs. The Blitz ended because the U.S. ran out of ammunition. That Kiska Blitz was a round-the-clock uh, operation Bomber crews went without sleep. PBYs were, bom were turned into bombers, pressed into service. Uh, many of the PBYs were serviced by the Gillis, which had deployed forward to Atka Island so that the PBYs could, could be rearmed and reloaded, uh, refueled with their, their bombs and torpedoes. One of the tactics they tried to use with the PBYs was to fly them over Kits Kiska, have them orbit, since they had a very long range and loiter time, and then look for holes in the, in the clouds and dive through those holes and drop bombs on the uh, Japanese on Kiska. Well, that tactic didn't work real well. But the Japanese thought the U.S. had a brand new weapon when these things came through the clouds at them. 
The crews were doing four-handed pullouts, and at least one aircraft, the uh, wing pulled off the aircraft and it was lost. Now, two months after the attack on, uh, on Dutch Harbor, the U.S. established a new base on Adak Island, much closer, Cold Bay. Uh, and this cut the previous round-trip bombing distance in half. The ADAC runway was made of steel mats and was often plagued by flooding since it had been built on reclaimed tidal flats. Another airfield would be uh, built even closer uh, a few months later. And Chitka Island became operational in February 1943. You can see the tent cities you know, the, along here that uh, were constructed to support the air crews that were deployed there. Something I sure wouldn't want to do. 25 P-38s were soon deployed to the new air base at ADAC. This long-range fighter may, was well-suited for the Aleutian campaign and was flown in the Aleutians for the rest of the war. But in Alaska, more lightnings were lost due to severe weather and other conditions than enemy action. On August 9th, 1942, two P-38s at the end of their thousand-mile long-range patrol happened upon a pair of Japanese Mavis flying boats. The flying boats were the first Japanese aircraft to be shot down by the P-38 in World War II. So that was their first kill. By the end of September 1942, ADAC was home to the 11th Air Force bombers and fighters, as well as a Canadian fighter squadron. The 250-mile distance from ADAC to Kiska put Kiska in range of the medium bombers, the B-25s and the B-26s. And now Attu was only 430 miles away, within easy reach of the heavy bombers, as well as the P-38. So the long-range B-24s were now able to carry full bomb loads to Attu, and the B-25s and B-26s uh, were able to attack Kiska several times each day. Allied attacks continued against Kiska and Attu, weather permitting. Japanese operations from Kiska consisted of a few reconnaissance missions over ADAC, or a nuisance bombing mission where the aircraft would drop one or two bombs and then uh, uh, disappear into the clouds, and causing no significant damage on ADAC. Despite the continued bombing by the U.S., little would change over the next eight months. But there are a few events that happened in, the, in that time frame that are worth mentioning. In September 1942, the Japanese briefly entered the Bering Sea and were spotted by a PBY. The U.S. reacted and thought the Japanese were headed to Nome, which was a critical base on the Lend-Lease route. So General Buckner mobilized all of the aircraft in Alaska, both military and civilian, and in 36 hours, he had moved 2,600 troops and 450 tons of supplies to Nome. The civilian aircraft were commandeered and pressed into service. These were mostly uh, uh, C-47s. Uh, but U.S. military aircraft, the bombers, were also converted to haul cargo so that they could get this, uh, this buildup done. Well, the Japanese never really did go into the Bering Sea. They turned around and go away, went away, but the U.S. nonetheless decided it needed to beef up its defenses in Nome. So eventually they had uh, 24 B-24s diverted who were going to Africa to go to Nome. Well, originally, since they were going to Africa, they were painted pink. <laughs> well, fortunately, on a stopover and uh, en route to Alaska, uh, some technicians, when they, when they stopped and had uh, at, uh, at Geiger Field, had the ability to paint aircraft, and they repainted the aircraft before they reached Alaska. So, so the pink aircraft never made it to Alaska. Another thing, by the, uh, by the end of October, the Japanese had decided to move from Kiska 
to Attu. It didn't move its, its entire garrison. It still kept a garrison on Kiska, but decided that Attu was more valuable to them than Kiska and still provided an anchor point for them. In January 1943, Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid replaced Admiral Theobald as the commander of the North Pacific Task Force and the commander of all the operations in the Aleutians. His relationship with General Buckner was much better. And together, they started to plan the raids and the U.S. efforts to recapture the Japanese-held U.S. islands. Eleven months after the Japanese occupation of the Aleutians, the U.S. began, began Operation Land Grab, which was the recapture of Attu. Um, U.S. forces were, in, were invaded, going to the main invasion from the south, a secondary invasion from the north, were to move in to rout the Japanese forces. Well, the Japanese forces had really retreated to the highlands and these in, uh, on Attu. So the weather and the terrain helped provide them a lot of defense uh, against the American invasion. So the Americans spent nearly a month trying to engage these Japanese troops. The Japanese troops kept moving to higher ground and, uh, and evading the U.S. invasion. Uh, finally, the U.S. had the Japanese trapped on a small hillside where they were running out of, of ammunition and food, so they were up here. So shortly before dawn on May 29th, 1943, the Japanese decided to do a last ditch effort. They made probably one of the largest bonsai charges of the Pacific War. Their troops charged down from their, their high points on the, in, in the mountains into the valleys, quickly went through the U.S. front lines in that area and ended up into the rear echelon where they finally were defeated by the overwhelming firepower that the U.S. had there. There's brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, Japanese fought to the end. There were 2,000 of them, uh, and they were all uh, killed during the battle. Uh, more than 500 U.S. troops died during the retaking of Attu. And so, with the fall of Attu, the Japanese began planning what they called Operation KE, or the evacuation of Kiska. They decided uh, that it was too difficult to hold on to the, Alash, uh, the Aleutian Islands, so after their defeat at Attu, the Japanese planned to move all of their troops off of Kiska. But summer weather in the Aleutians, the fog and the winds, had plagued uh, both Japanese efforts to get to Kiska and uh, evacuate the troops, as well as U.S. reconnaissance of Kiska. But finally, on July 28, 1943, the weather broke, and two cruisers and six destroyers from the Japanese Navy entered Kiska Harbor in the early afternoon. The Japanese garrison was well ready for evacuation, and they uh, destroyed or damaged most of the, uh, the weapons and booby trap things and equipment uh, and, take, and left all of their supplies. But in a matter of 50 minutes, over 5,000 men were able to evacuate Kiska, board the ships, and head for the Japanese homeland. The U.S. didn't have a clue that the Japanese had left Kiska. And so, 18 days later, and days of, of heavy shelling by Navy ships, the battleship Pennsylvania was shelling Kiska along with other heavy cruisers, destroyers. The U.S. invaded Kiska. Allied force of 34,000 men in the largest military operations in the Aleutians. Operation Cottage was an Allied operation. Canadians were involved in it too. It was designed to retake Kiska. Well, 
Despite the lack of an enemy, nearly 100 Allied troops died during the operation. But the war in the Aleutians had come to an end. Initially, the Aleutian campaign was a victory for Japan, which they boldly announced to their citizens. They didn't say much about Midway, other than Midway was a distraction so they could invade and conquer Alaska. For the U.S., the Aleutian campaign was more a matter of pride. The President and Joint Chiefs of Staff couldn't ignore the fact that the territory of Alaska and parts of North America had been invaded by the Japanese. But it kind of turned out that the, the weather and the geography was really a larger adversary for both the U.S. and Japan than either side was for each other. And ultimately, after a year of virtual stalemates, the Alaskan campaign was a success. The invading force had been expelled, and the U.S. could now claim their first theater-wide victory against Japan. Well, the U.S. went on to quickly upgrade the airfields on Kiska and Attu and added another airfield on nearby Shimia to allow increased use of the Aleutians as a stepping stone to Japan. The U.S. didn't hesitate to start a propaganda campaign to make the Japanese believe that the U.S. would attack Japan from the Aleutians. The, the uh, radio and message traffic that the U.S. created in this propaganda campaign eventually had the Japanese believe that there were over 400,000 troops in Alaska and 700 aircraft in the Aleutians, when in fact the U.S. forces were undergoing a major reduction in force. In late summer of 1943, only two bomber squadrons with older B-24s and B-25s and Fleet Air Wing 4 with PBYs and PV-1s were left. There was a brief discussion about basing the B-29 in the Aleutians, but the weather and distance and logistical support required uh, had the U.S. looking for other areas. But to reinforce that propaganda campaign, the U.S. had to press on with attacks against the Kuril Islands. So, in September 1943, the U.S. launched a major attack on the Kurils with eight B-24s and 12 B-25s. The result was a disaster. Only five of the B-24s and five of the B-25s returned, a 50% loss. PBYs continued to be used in the Aleutians. They were used for night missions against the Kuril Islands. In December 1943, a flight of four PBYs successfully conducted night reconnaissance missions using the photo flash bombs. And the, the PV-1 here joined the Catalina in a lot of those future night missions. So the Japanese saw the U.S. continuing to come, minor attacks, but a lot of reconnaissance work, which would have supported the campaign to provide an invasion through the Kuril Islands. In January 1944, a naval task force was assembled to shell the Kuril Islands, again to reinforce the uh, uh, propaganda campaign. But the task force had no aircraft carrier. The idea was to use air support provided by P-38s flying from Attu that would cover the task force's withdrawal after they shelled the Kurils. Well, of the 16 P-38s that were dispatched, to cover the withdrawal of the ships, only six established contact with the task force. Two of the aircraft and pilots were lost simply to weather or misguided navigation, and the other eight aborted due to the weather. That air support mission was a failure and ended the idea that P-38s from the Aleutians could provide fighter escort for ships attacking the Kuril Islands. Propaganda campaign, however, was successful. Japanese moved 60,000 troops and nearly 600 aircraft into the northern Kuril Islands by mid-1944. Japanese concern about an attack from Alaska helped the U.S. 
take Guam and the, the uh, Mariana Islands, with, which the U.S. would go on to use those tropical islands for their B-29 basing. And then finally, on February 11th, 1945, at the Yalta Summit, President Roosevelt agreed that the Kuril Islands should go to the Soviet Union for, in exchange for their entry into the war against Japan. From then on to the end of the war, any U.S. attack on Japan from Alaska would only be an option on paper. Price of the Aleutians was high. Over 1,000 Allied losses, 3,500 Japanese losses. Most of these losses were all on, on uh, the invasion of Attu. 225 Allied aircraft were lost, but only 41 of those were lost in combat. The U.S. sank eight transports and three destroyers, damaged another three destroyers in the, in their, uh, uh, in the battle. But the PBYs were there through all of it. Now, if you have any questions about the battle for Alaska, I don't know how, we may have a few minutes, Gene. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Uh, Please uh, let me get the mic to you so everybody can hear your questions. But a couple of comments before. That airplane, this PBY right here, was built in Canada. It's called a Canso, and it flew anti-submarine patrols out of Keflavik, Iceland, at near the end of the war. A lot of great stories about PBYs. The, 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 the record during sea rescue, they, put, they rescued 27 guys and put them on that one airplane. Uh, during the sinking of the Indianapolis, a PBY ran on the crew in the water, and they couldn't get everybody aboard and then take off. So they rescued 54 men and strapped a lot of them to the top of the wing and used the airplane as a life raft until uh, other PBYs could come in and pick them up. So it's a really unique airplane. Uh, with that, how about questions? Yes, sir. I know the PBY carried bombs. Where were they carried and how did they release them? Hard points on the wings. Uh, and uh, they didn't really have bomb sites and they weren't very accurate, but they would Hello. carry bombs or torpedoes on hard points under the wings. Bombs, depth charges, torpedoes. Uh, they painted some of them black and used them as night attack airplanes. They were called the Black Cats. Got a question over here with a young man. Let's see what he's got. Why were there three machine guns on the Catalina is my question. Why just three or why three? Well, uh, the, the am can I take that one? Um, the, the actual uh, armament varied, depends upon the theater, the mission. Some of them had lots of machine guns. Some of them had 20 millimeter cannons in the nose. Um, so they were both for defensive firepower. Uh, the blisters that you see there on, on this side on the back had 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, later on in the war, a lot of them had turrets in the front. So it depended upon where in the war you were and the kind of mission that they were going to fly, what kind of squadron they were attached to, what their armament would be. Other questions? Back here. Get my shoes on here. This is kind of a nerdy question. Uh, there was a slide that showed a painting of B-17s attacking one of the islands. Uh, I thought I saw a biplane that w had been shot down. I wondered if that was a Japanese peat, if they were used in the Aleutians. Yeah, we'd go back to that and study it. Let's see. I just like the pictures, why I put it in. <laughs> because uh, it probably has more uh, B-17s in that one photo than uh, were stationed in Alaska at that time. Yeah, it does look like the, uh, uh, those were the uh, amphibious, the sea blade. Okay, a question here. 
it seems like I remembered. I recall that when I was a kid, that the troops that were sent up there, the ground troops had a extra difficult time because they were thinking they were going over to the desert, and we didn't have the winter clothes to furnish these guys. They went up there, and uh, in fact, I noticed pilots all lined up while ago. Most of them had their hands in their pockets. So, if you could comment on that. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a lot like uh, the, the pink B-24s that were headed from Alaska, diverted from the, uh, the theater. But that happened throughout the war, where, where people were diverted. But you're exactly right. Uh, a lot of times, people arrived and they didn't have the equipment. It's just like the, uh, the poor souls on Dutch Harbor who had initially arrived there but didn't know where the shelters were. So there, was, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of horror stories especially in Alaska in this Aleutian campaign of, of, I guess, what you would call positively lessons learned. Yeah, just, just confirmation on that. My dad flew a C-47 in the Aleutians, and he said the same thing, that they weren't, when they came up there, their gear was for, more for Africa than Alaska. But the PBY, what, is, what are the initials? stand for? Patrol Bomber Consolidated. It's a Navy designation. The, the first two are what it is. The last one is who made it. And did you say that there was a ship that went down in the Battle of Attu? A ship? I did not say so. Okay, I just wondered if no. you did. Okay, over here. Yeah, thanks for covering PBY. What was the why? Consolidated. Cool. <laughs> Question uh, with regards to the aerodynamics and design of the big plexiglass windows on the sides. Number one, are those removable? Number two, what was the primary intent of uh, those beautiful bubbles? The blisters were actually there so that the observers could look out so if you're flying along in the cockpit, your visibility is very limited. So they could actually look out and look down. So if they were looking for down pilots, it was better visibility. If you look at the pedestal that's right under the wing, and then you see a window, that's where the F-Light engineer sat. I have a question. Uh, why did none of the aircraft carriers from Midway go to the Lucian Islands to aid the Alaska? Well, they weren't needed at that time because the Japanese had withdrawn their task force and all their carriers and uh, uh, all their fighting ships to support and reconstitute the fleet they had lost at Midway. So there wasn't any reason for the U.S. to respond with carriers to Alaska. What paint schemes did they use? Why is this one bright yellow? And what, like, depending on geography or what it was used for? Yeah, these are in the neutral colors. These uh, prior to uh, World War, U.S. entry into World War II, aircraft were painted in this neutral color to show that they were non-combatants. Okay, we're going to let uh, Ian give a quick five-minute little spiel, and then we're going to go out and fly an airplane. I'm Ian Wayman. I'm a volunteer here at the National Museum of World War II Aviation at Colorado Springs Airport. And uh, we are going to be talking about the Battle of Alaska today. And I will be flying the PBY. This particular PBY was originally built uh, in Montreal as a PBV, a, a Canto, Canadian built. Um, it was with the RCAF, uh, built in um, 44, uh, June of 44, so it's now 79 years old, and it served uh, with the Eastern Air Command for the RCAF, Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, later ended up fighting forest fires up in uh, Canada, and in uh, about 92 or 3, it was retired from fighting forest fires, and it uh, went to South Africa, and the current owner restored it spent six years restoring it in South Africa 
and they brought it back to the United States in about 2012. I'm grateful it's part of the National Museum of World War II Aviation now because I get to fly it. The PBY was originally designed and built and first flew in uh, March of 1935 and it was uh, a patrol bomber. It could fly for over 20 hours. They had a kitchen in it, they had bunks in it, and long patrols. Uh, they'd be looking for downed airmen, they'd be looking for uh, submarines. They, carried, uh, they could carry bombs out on hard, hard, hard points excuse me, uh, to drop on submarines if they needed to. Uh, they did all sorts of roles, and then obviously this one fought forest fires after the war from about 62 to about 93. Yeah, hopefully you'll come out to the National Museum of World War II Aviation here at the Colorado Springs Airport and check it out for yourself. This and other airplanes are all airworthy and we fly them on a regular case. So please come out to the museum and, and check them out for yourself.